Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Second Chances, Collateral Consequences, Community Strengths. Um, we are uh, excited here at the library to, to, have, to partner with UMKC's Clear My Record Project. And I get to be here with Sydney Ragsdale and Johnny Waller from the project. This is being recorded right now, and I will follow up um, the invitation that I sent to all, to all of you um, with, a with a recording link and with resources that we're going to mention during this, um, during this panel discussion. So I'm Jenny Garman, the Civic Engagement Specialist here at the library, and we're continuing um, an expungement awareness campaign that really started on March 16th with a screening of returning and redemption um, at UMKC. Um, and this is continuing into April. We're sort of launching Second Chances Month. Maybe um, you're wondering what it means for April to be Second Chance Month. When the White House uh, issued the proclamation last year for April as Second Chances Month, they shared that Second Chances are about the foundational importance of helping people who were formerly incarcerated re-enter society, as well as meaningful opportunities for rehabilitation and redemption as part of that re-entry. The White House noted that thousands of legal and regulatory restrictions prevent these individuals from accessing employment, housing, voting, education, business licensing, and other basic opportunities. Because of these barriers, nearly 75% of people who were formerly incarcerated are still unemployed a year after being released. Today we'll be talking about collateral consequences of a criminal record, some of which I just mentioned, diving into expungements and why they are important, especially as that relates to community strengths, and sharing information about how you can get involved. Much of the material that we'll reference is available to you from the library, um, and I'm going to share that resource list uh, as Sydney and Johnny introduce themselves a little bit more. Hi everyone, I am a uh, Sydney Ragsdale and I am an attorney with the uh, UMKC School of Law Clear My Record Project and the Expungement Clinic. Um, I supervise law students in the Expungement Clinic as they um, take on cases of their own and represent people in court who uh, cannot afford a lawyer in their expungement proceedings. Hi, I'm Johnny Waller. I'm the uh, program manager at the Expungement Clinic at the UMKC School of, of Law. And so I work with Sydney on a regular basis and we do expungements. And I also go out into the community and uh, build coalitions and work with organizations and help develop resources for people around uh, collateral consequences of criminal work. And I'm sorry, we had um, the executive director of DocuCore is scheduled to be with us today, um, but he's been called away to Atlanta, uh, I think, to a for a film festival, which is really exciting. Uh, Johnny, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about DocuCourse and Be Great Together and what those documentaries were about. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. A good friend of mine, Abe Stokes, um, he is the executive director of Be Great Together. Um, he released a series of documentaries called DocuCourts, and you can go to DocuCourts.org, sign up for free. Um, and he, the first one was Arts and Advocacy, um, where he explored um, how artists can be, can do advocacy um, through their works, and through their murals. Um, the second one was Return and Redemption, which we created at UMKC Law School, kind of the March 16th event that started this uh, expungement awareness campaign. Um, yesterday, Bells and Bonds came out. Um, so you can check that out on uh, DocuCourse. And yes, Abe was called away to uh, to uh, Atlanta. So he had to catch an early flight. And so I wish him, wish him well. He's been nominated. He got a bunch of things for, for uh, to be in film festivals. And I think he's on like IMBD, like he's been finding on IMBD right now, so it's he's he's really doing well. Um, I talked to him this morning, um, but within the docu course, it's it's half documentary and then half um, community lessons that you can learn, so you can 
learn how to get involved with the community, how to get involved with uh, second chance organizations, how you can relate to um, directly impact the people or returning citizens. So it's a really good uh, a docu-series and it kind of started this whole awareness campaign. And if whoever is Sydney or Johnny, if you want to kind of talk about what is what do those collateral consequences mean? I think I did cover some of them in the White House proclamation, but can you share a little bit more about what that means, that that collateral consequence? Yeah, the collateral consequences of a criminal record, there's approximately 1.8 million people in Missouri who, who have a criminal record. Um, there is a National Institute of Collateral Consequences, and they deem that there are over 44,000 collateral consequences for someone with a criminal record. And that affects people's ability to get a job, housing, uh, benefits, access to health care, uh, substance abuse care, mental, mental health care, um, that produces a stigma. Uh, many people have to live with for for a very long time and so these are the collateral consequences that we talk about um when we think about people being being released and they've done their time their period of incarceration or whether they're on probation or parole uh, once they have that criminal record when employers do a background check um, they're less likely to be hired when people go to an apartment complex or try to rent a house or something again the background check and 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 they they're not uh they're not able to get that uh housing that they need or they may in in missouri they might apply for for food stamps especially if you have a drug a drug conviction and you may automatically be um disqualified and so there's a lot of things that come with with the collateral consequences. I believe in Missouri, there's 900 collateral consequences on the federal side, 700 on the state side, and that does not include the collateral consequences from just policies, not even not even laws, but policies from different employers who simply have chosen uh, not to hire people uh, with a criminal record. Thanks, Johnny. And I did forget to mention earlier on, but I'm asking some questions. Um, but I, we'd love to hear from you also if you want to put your questions in the chat or in q and I'll be watching those and I'll bring them up as um, throughout the, the panel discussion here. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Sydney? To what Johnny was talking about? Um. Well, I think he's definitely one to speak to them more than I am. Um, but just from uh, what I've seen with some of my clients who uh, I've represented in expungement proceedings, um, it can range from, you know, not being able to get housing to not being able to get a job to just the way they feel about themselves. And it can be a real internalization of how they see themselves. I had one client who thought, you know, it meant that she wouldn't get to be with her mother in heaven um, when she passed. And I had never, when she said that, I had never realized it could go like that deep um, and have that deep of an impact on someone. Um, so it, it can affect everything and anything in someone's life. Um, yeah, that's that's what I've seen as far as collateral consequences. Um, but yeah, I, I've never personally experienced them and and Johnny has and I know that he's told me some stories that I just I can't even imagine applying for 170 jobs and still trying still trying to get another one and thinking it was possible that just um, incredible resilience you have. Okay. And I guess I could have shared that I am a directly impacted person. I was convicted of possession and possession to deliver. Um, and I received a two and a half to five year and then an additional eight months. And so as Sydney pointed out, um, when I was released, I applied for 175 jobs. I didn't, I didn't get any of them. 
Um, at that time, there was a plan for, uh, you couldn't go to school if you had a, a felony drug conviction, you couldn't get a, a like a bail grant or financial aid. So I couldn't, I couldn't go to school and uh, no one would, no one wanted me to live <laughs> at their apartment mm -hmm. complex. So I kind of, I was just really stuck. So. One of the, and, and that's, that is real life. And it's also real life that you are making an incredible difference right here, right now in the community and, and reaching out and making connections so that people don't have to walk that same road. I wonder if you'd share a little bit about um, the Clear My Record project. I first heard of it when I came on board with the library. Um, I think it was the summer of 2019 the UMKC School of Law had an expungement clinic, and you all had an incredible response from the community about that. Would you share a little bit about how the Clear Man Record Project got started? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Sydney answer that first. She's been around a lot longer than me. <laughs> <laughs> I will try my best. I, I was not, I haven't been around as long as um, some of our team members uh, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, but from, I'll, I'll do my best, but from what I understand is yes, uh, when the a law passed in 2016, it went into effect in 2018, and this law really opened up um, more possibilities as far as expungement is concerned in Missouri. Um, and Dean Allen Suny and um, some of our other team members, Kylie Gomez, Paul Barnum, Scott Stockwell, um, Ayub Ajmi, um, they, uh, they were all on the ground floor of this. They saw that there was an opportunity um, coming and they wanted to be a part of it and help as much as they could. Uh, so they ha held an event and said, you know, come, if you want to get your uh, criminal record cleared, come see if you're eligible and see if you qualify for our assistance. And uh, they put it out on Facebook and it spread like wildfire. And they had uh, thousand some people show up and uh, about a thousand applicants and um, so that's how they realized how great the need was uh, and then they discovered that the law was actually a lot more limiting than previously thought uh, with what is really on the ground and what people really have and are dealing with um, so of those thousand people most of them were not eligible. Um, more people were eligible under the new law, but still not nearly enough. So the Clear My Record project formed because they said, you know, more has to be done. This isn't enough. This isn't addressing the needs like it said it would and was intended to do. Um, and so they uh, qualified for a grant from the Missouri Foundation of Health and the Clear My Record project was formed and they hired uh, myself and Johnny. And we are trying to make expungement in the state of Missouri more fair, effective and efficient because it is not right now. Uh, it is possible right now, but it could be better. So um, when I, a little bit later, when I talk about the, how the expungement law currently is in Missouri, um, I'll also talk a little bit about where it's going and what might possibly be on the horizon. Uh, I know yesterday I was in Jeff City and there were um, three expungement bills heard and uh, before the Judiciary Committee in the House and they very much understand that the need is there to fix it and uh, just a matter of what bill's actually gonna come out next year, but it is in a state of flux and hopefully we'll be improving more as uh, time goes on and hopefully um, clear my record. Well, I know we will, we'll be a part of it too. <laughs> Would you share a little bit um, about what expungement means? What does it mean to expunge uh, a record, to clear a record in Missouri? Okay, um, <laughs> what does it mean legally? Um, yes. Yeah, so. In Missouri, um, under the main expungement law, it is not a destruction of record, but it's a, a sealing of record, essentially. And um, it's 
it makes the record so it's not accessible to the general public anymore um, and not accessible to the vast majority of employers. There are some exceptions. Um, some certain types of employers, uh, they are still allowed to see the records. These are a lot of government agencies, um, Department of Revenue, law enforcement courts, uh, entities like that. They can still see the records. Um, one of the bills, one of the expungement bills yesterday that they were discussing was a bill to make it so the records were destroyed. So they were just gone. Um, and, you know, there's some, I think there are mostly good things about that, but I, I understand there are some drawbacks and um, there is more resistance to doing that. But, so I don't know if that one will pass, but I do think it, it should be um, less accessible than it is, but I will say it is for the most part inaccessible and can open up uh, a whole bunch of opportunities and things that had previously been denied. It really makes a difference for people when they're looking for employment or looking for a loan or trying to rent housing. It, it should in most cases be a huge benefit for people in that regard. Yeah, and I can start to the practical. I, I'm, I think I'm the only person I know who received a pardon, Governor, Secretary of State, and Attorney General. And then I turned around and, and received an, an expungement. And yeah, like Cindy was saying, the you know, I remember the first time I applied for something that said, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And I checked no. Nope. And, and it came back. I think I, I think I printed it off and probably going to frame it because it came back blank. Right. And so at that point, you kind of, it's like the, you know, not the first day of the rest of your life, but maybe like the second day of the rest of your life. And you get to ponder, like, you know, uh, I think I told Sydney at some point, uh, I've been living here for in this apartment for 15 years. And simply because the, the people who owned it allowed me uh, to stay here conditionally for six months, right? Like they were like, we're going to give you six months. We're going to see what happens. Uh, but now I can move. Like this is the first time in my life that I can I can actually go live wherever I want to. I can go work and within you know reason to do things that where I don't have to check where I don't have to check a box. I even I had to apply for a cell phone for T-Mobile and and it even listed my criminal background on T-Mobile. I, I didn't even understand like how that had to do with cellular service, but I guess somehow they thought it was relevant need to have a cell phone um and so now like i don't have to check any box and so it's really one of those moments in life to where you can kind of like sit back and think like do i want to go do do i want to go do that or do i want to work here do i want to live over here because before it was it was like no you're gonna you're gonna live with someone allows you to live you're going to work where someone allows you to work you're going to do these things that people allow you to do and it's really it's really like being in a prison within itself right you get out of a physical prison then you come out here and you're really still in prison because nobody really wants to do anything so so the expungement is like you know the light at the end of the tunnel it's like the it's it's it's, it's, it's the breath to new life uh, after you have it. That's that's uh, that's awesome. That's awesome, Johnny. And you, and you launched right into my next question, which was talking about how do communities get stronger because of the second chances, because of the the this this new life that this new breath that you have. Um, I wondered if you would talk a little bit about Determination Incorporated. Um, one of the organizations that's listed on the resource list. And also, if you're just joining us, I know we've had a few folks just join the webinar. Um, I'm asking questions, but I'd love to see if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A, and I'll keep an eye out for that because we will, we will ask your questions and we'll do our best to answer them. So if you'd like to, so this is my question for you, Johnny. Um, would you share a little bit about how that got started too? 
that yeah, and the community it's, strengths, it's, right? Like yeah. The, yeah. Funny story, that's how I met Dean Sooney uh, and learned about the expungement clinic. I went to the university. It was back when uh, Kiki Curls uh, was introducing you know, and that's when I originally met Dean Sooney. But I was the co-founder of Determination Incorporated. And at that time we were turning uh, returning citizens into entrepreneurs because we we figure you know the best if no one will give you a job just create one all right and so we went on this me and Cal Smith went on this journey and I believe we hosted the first entrepreneurial competition for returning citizens in Kansas City history at the Flex Pod uh, we flew in a guy who runs Flick Shop which is uh, he goes around the entire country he built an app that allows um, people to send postcards and different items uh, electronically uh, to a bunch of different prisons. He, he himself was incarcerated, and so he's a good guy. We we keep in touch uh, all the time. He was at the White House, and he's been at Princeton. He's done a he's done a bunch of uh, other things, and so um, and then me and Cal talked about uh, like social enterprises. So Cal's launched the the uh, Make Ready program. It's something we talked about a couple of years ago. And it's just my surprise, he said, so I had posted, reposted his job uh, opportunity. And he said, somebody, you know, somebody seen it on your, your LinkedIn profile and that's who they hired. And that's now the, the foreman uh, for the Make, Make Ready program. And so building this, uh, you know, entrepreneurial ecosystem where people who are extremely marginalized to have a criminal record can, you know, flourish and and pursue whatever it is. When I was in prison, there were some very talented and smart individuals who, who were incarcerated. Um, and so giving them the opportunity, the knowledge and the access to do something different uh, has been excellent. That's what meant how uh, had tried to do. I had. I ended up leaving Determination Incorporated. Me and Kyle still talk all the time. That's my buddy. We've got a new project uh, coming up with some people at UMKC and some other community leaders. And of course, we'll drag Jenny into it because you know she's our community partner. And so, yeah, if anybody wants to do entrepreneurialism, um, want access to those resources. Reach out to Determination Inc., Cal Smith. You can tell them Johnny sent you, hey, and Cal will take care of you. Um, and there's the Rise Up. And you can catch Global Entrepreneurship Week. You can catch it there. Rise Up, Get Started Challenge. Um, you can you can do that. But um, for, for people who ordinarily <laughs> would have to work in these, you know, non-livable wage jobs and, and feel like you're stuck or don't have that particular hope. Like you can be an entrepreneur. I own a jewelry store. I own a media company too. I'm a business coach at Gift, uh, generating income for tomorrow. I have an office at 5008 Prospect. And so you can really go out and, and build an organization uh, despite having a, having a criminal record. Oh, you're, thank you. you're on mute. Yeah, thank oh, okay. you, Johnny. Thank you very yeah. much. I, what I want to do too is I think sometimes what happens is uh, if people join a little bit later, they don't get to see the the link that I put in there. So I'm adding the resource list again because a lot of the the resources that we're talking about, Determina Determination Incorporated Gift, um, basically, if you're looking for the helpers, we're trying to make sure that they're on this resource list. And if you're a helper and you're listening and you're not on the resource list, you let me know and I will get you on there. Um, so yeah, that's it is just really great. One of my favorite things, Johnny, that you mentioned uh, when we were all together at the expungement information session in December was that this is all about relationships. It's not about a link. It's not about, it's like you said, tell them Johnny sent you. Um, and it's about people. And so that's really what we're trying to make sure that we are connected and that we are um, really just weaving a community together and getting stronger that way. Um, Sydney, I think that you had a slide that you wanted to share. Is that right? I had, um, I have a PowerPoint, um, okay. but 
we can keep it as this Q and A if you want. It's kind of wordy. I'm I'm can wide open. This short? is pretty informal. This is kind of like a living room <laughs> conversation. Oh, did I just say living room conversation? Oh, <laughs> we're gonna get back to that later. <laughs> yes. Oh no, Sydney, share your. Uh, I think for people who uh, there's the community personally impacted people's side, but there's also the legal side of of expungements, and I think people people need to know that if if you're gonna if you're gonna apply for an expungement or hopefully come out and help, and we can all rally and increase what expungements is doing, like we all need to know like how it actually worked. <laughs> yeah, and what our starting point is. Yeah, it's just the beginning. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I will go ahead and hopefully share the right screen. Some reason. Can we see that? Okay, cool. All right. Let's see if I can operate it. Okay. Um, so as uh we've kind of alluded to already, um Expungement in Missouri is in a state of flux and it's uh, ever changing. Um, we have a lot more work that we hope to do um, because it's not perfect the way it is there. It's confusing and complicated and there are a lot of limitations and a lot of requirements. Um, and it, it can be really difficult to navigate even for attorneys. Uh, we watch the court's docket online all the time, and we see attorneys and pro se people struggling with just some of the weird technical requirements that expungement has. Um, so we're trying to get the word out more, so hopefully people will struggle a little bit less, but know that it's not you, <laughs> it's definitely the law. Um, so I'll start off by talking about some of the limitations uh, one of the biggest ones right now is under the main expungement law, you can only get one felony record and two misdemeanor records um, expunged. And I, I had this slide um, before uh, today for a presentation a month or so ago, and I had to change it because I used to say one felony case and two, mis and two misdemeanor cases, um, but recently there was a decision in the Court of Appeals that uh, we don't love, but it changed it from case to record. Um, and I won't go into too much of the technical reasons of why, but essentially it means um, that even if you are charged with a felony and then you end up being convicted of a misdemeanor, if you wanna get that whole case expunged, it's gonna count as your one felony. And up until then, we had been understanding it to mean what you're convicted of matters. That's what is calculated in these lifetime limits because you know people can be charged with anything. And, and so that's not what you're actually guilty of, which shouldn't count against you. Um, but that's a that was an unfortunate decision. Hopefully it's uh, something that will get appealed and overturned if not addressed legislatively. Um, we we hopefully will not let that stand for very long. Um, so this lifetime limit, even if it is one felony case and two misdemeanor cases, it's still pretty limited. Uh, in our experience, the through the applicants we've received, it's, that's not enough for most people to really get their life back and uh, have like a meaningful second chance. So we are uh, looking to expand that limit in a couple of the bills in the legislature right now, um, there is an effort to raise those. One bill has the limits being raised to um, two felonies and three misdemeanors. And there is another bill that has uh, it being raised to three felonies and five misdemeanors. Um, but like I said, that's in the legislature and it's pending. And that's probably an area that there might be pushback on, but uh, hopefully this year we'll at least get it raised to two felonies and three misdemeanors. Um, there are exceptions to this limit. 
this is only the limit for the main expungement statute. There are a whole bunch of little, not a whole bunch, but a few um, uh, types of expungement that have their own law or their own statute, and those don't count towards that limit. So an example would be the marijuana expungement. If you get an expungement um, under the constitution, that won't count towards your number. Um, the same is true for a uh, misdemeanor DUI and a, um, a felony non-support. And there are a couple other ones, but those don't count towards that total limit. Um, additionally, there is this course of conduct exception. And if you're, um, if you have multiple felonies or misdemeanors in the same case, it will only count as one for the purposes of calculating these limits and it'll count as the highest one. Um, so moving on to limitation number two, not all types of offenses can be expunged. And that's a big limitation. Um, right now it's pretty much only uh, nonviolent and non-sexual offenses. Um, and the, there's a long list and it's hard to dice through. So what we've kind of done is compiled a list of common offenses that are eligible and we can go over that and you can always um, reach out to us via email or in the chat right now and ask and, and we can get you the answer on if an offense is uh, eligible or not. But for, a, for the most part, it's nonviolent, non-sexual offenses. So drug offenses, stealing, traffic offenses, um, things of that nature uh, are the ones that are eligible currently. Um, but we, again, like I said, we're looking at expanding it to include more offenses. Uh, so, and limitation number three, I did talk about this a little bit earlier, so I won't talk about it too much, but there are some employers and agencies that can still see the records and, uh, background check companies, they are uh, kind of a problem. Uh, one that legislation is also looking at addressing, they don't update their records very frequently. Um, so, the, you know, when somebody gets an expungement, they don't automatically update their records because it's just not in their financial interests, I guess. Um, they will, I think, take it down if you address it with them directly with like an expungement order. So if you're if that's something you're concerned about, you can always check with um, the employer or a landlord, try and you know figure out what company they use so you can make sure that that company has updated records when they do your background check. Um, but like I said, that is something that legislation uh, is looking at. And I heard from uh, the Senate or no, the representatives, that's something they're really concerned about too. So I do think that hopefully something will be done about that soon um, because the internet is a very vast place. And um, once something gets on there, it, it's challenging um, without some sort of legislation to help you. It's challenging to like really get it removed from all places. Um, so now I'll talk about the requirements uh, a little bit. There is a clean waiting period. Um, for each offense that you want to get expunged. For felonies, it's three years. So that means in that three years, um, that the three years immediately before you file, you cannot have gotten um, found guilty of any felony or misdemeanor, but that doesn't include traffic misdemeanors or traffic violations. Um, so, and then the it's the same requirement for misdemeanors, but that waiting period is only one year instead of three. Um, requirement number two is uh, you don't have any outstanding case-related debt on the case that you wanna expunge. This is, um, I, I feel like this surprises people a lot. You, you might have paid several different fines and fees, but the way the court does it, there are like, there can be four or five different categories of fines and fees. And so you think you've paid them all and rightfully so, but they have this other category that you didn't realize was a whole nother category and they're saying it's still outstanding. So um, it's frustrating, uh, but one uh, easy way to check um, is if your case is on CaseNet. Um, and I, 
it's like courts.mo.gov. I might have that wrong. Um, but if you Google Missouri courts, you should get there and go to the litigant search. You can look up your case, um, click on your case. And then on that first page, that's your case. There's a, a little uh, tiny blue square with a dollar sign in it. And if you click it, it'll a pop-up will show and it'll show you if you have any outstanding case balance. Um, and that's a really great way to know uh, if you have anything to worry about with regard to that requirement. Um, and requirement number three is that you don't have any charges currently pending. Unfortunately, this includes unresolved traffic tickets, which like, you know, so many of us have, and they're just a headache sometimes that you forget about, but that is something you have to have taken care of and uh, cleared up before you file. But um, like I said, traffic doesn't count for that clean waiting period. So you can do that up until the time you file. It's not, it's not a blocker that would reset that clock um, of, of waiting that you have to do before you can get certain offenses expunged. Um, requirement number four is that you have to be able to pay a pretty enormous fee. Um, right now, expungement is way too expensive, and you'll be happy to know that there is much discussion about that in the legislature about uh, uh, getting that uh, fee down significantly. Um, it includes this weird surcharge fee of $250. I think that's the number one thing people are, are looking about getting rid of. Um, it also includes the local court filing fee, which is usually around $100. And then it includes service fees. Expungement cases are essentially, you are the plaintiff and you are suing all the state agencies that have official copies of your record. And you're saying, hey, you know, I meet these requirements, stop reporting my record, seal it, make it inaccessible to the general public. It's it's a lawsuit against these companies for holding your record. If hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, so uh, you, you have to serve each of those agencies. If you don't serve an agency, they don't have to close your record, um, which can be a huge problem if you, you know, miss one of the bigger ones like Department of Corrections, which most people do because it's not on any forms. It's, you know, the court hasn't, they didn't put it on their pro se form as an agency that you might want to check. But that's a huge one that you definitely do want to check if you were under any sort of Department of Correction supervision. Um, they have a public sunshine file on their website. It's really hard to download. So most people can't see it, which is somewhat reassuring, but not really because background check companies can scrape it and they use it and they scrape the records from it and report them. So they're, a, they're someone you definitely wanna serve. Um, that fee, uh, like I said, is um, it's really high. There is a way to qualify for a fee waiver from the court. Um, they have pretty strict income limits and they're, they're way lower than they probably should be. Um, so it leaves a lot of people kind of in this a uh, gray area of they don't qualify for the fee waiver, but they can't afford an attorney. Um, so what do they do? Well, if you're in that situation, you can come to our clinic because we do represent people in that situation free of charge. Um, we help people who can't afford a lawyer and do qualify for the fee waiver. We help them as well as people who are kind of in that grayer area of they can't afford a lawyer, but they don't qualify for um, the court's income limits. So, and uh, some common eligible uh, felony offenses, um, some of the ones that we've seen uh, most, most of um, in our expungement cases, this is a list of some of them, um, possession of a controlled substance, tampering, stealing, burglary in the second degree, delivery of a controlled substance, um, resisting arrest, receiving stolen property, passing bad check, unlawful use of a weapon, concealed carry or exhibiting, property damage, fraudulent use of a credit or debit card. Unfortunately, at this time, um, forgery is not included, but that is one that um, hopefully will be expungible um, come August 2023. 
Um, and so these are some misdemeanors and I won't go through all of them. Um, this information will be available to you after. So uh, I don't wanna take up too much time, uh -uh. Um, but marijuana expungements, ah, they're crazy. Um, what's the court gonna do? <laughs> they're, they're biding their time on saying anything. So it's uh, interesting because there are these really tight deadlines they have. I don't think they're gonna make them. Um, if you have any questions about that, just let me know. I've been talking about it uh, quite often, but I wanna get through all of this. Um, one of the biggest questions though about marijuana expungements are what's happening with municipal marijuana ordinance violations. We're, we argue that they should be included, but as of right now, the courts are operating like they're not. So mm, it's unfortunate. Um, I'm going to turn it back over because I feel like I've been talking way too long. I'm sorry. <laughs> just You're sharing really important information, Sydney. I really appreciate it. And I just want to <laughs> remind folks if you've uh, if you're if you're like, I didn't catch all of that. This is being recorded. This recording will be available on the library's YouTube channel um, and it will be sent to you um, since you registered for for this for this webinar. And please, um, if you've got questions, we can wait till the end. Uh, maybe after we stop recording, you might feel more comfortable to ask the question. Um, but we will have some time at the end for for questions. So please. Feel free to ask them now if you like um, in the chat or in the Q&A and we can, we can take it from there. Yeah, well, this was a lot of really helpful and useful information, Sydney. I really appreciate it. I know one of the things we wanted to cover um, today in this webinar too is how you can get involved. You're listening, you're with us today or you're listening to this recording, you say, I. I want to do something about this. This is happening to me in my life or to somebody I care about. How can I get involved? How can I help be a part of um, helping our community to be stronger, stronger together? And we have some answers for you. Johnny, did you want to start us off? Because you've got some, some really great folks that you know. Sorry, I had to find the... You're fine. Okay, so what were we asking? We're talking about, um, well, first of all, I have a great question in here. It's how long does the expungement process typically take? Returning citizens still have to work while they wait. So what are they supposed to do until everything has been expunged? Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, I can speak to uh, a little bit about how long it takes. Um, it depends on the county. Uh, some counties are more familiar with expungements than others, um, so they do them quicker and some do them pretty slow. Uh, but they have, um, from the time the petition is filed, they have six months. They can't keep it on their docket longer than that. So it should be within six months from the time the petition is filed. In Jackson County, uh, usually takes from the time you file uh, until you're granted an expungement two to three months. Um, Platt County, I believe, is more like three or four months. So it's it's in that range of a couple months, which can be a long time mm -hmm. uh, to wait. And what you're supposed to do in the meantime is uh, not easy. But hope you know, hopefully, we're we're collecting these uh, resources and community together, and and that might be um, somewhere you look during that time while you wait. And uh, Johnny, I'm sure, can speak yeah, to that a little bit more. So yeah, yeah, and so that that's a that's a very good question. So in the interim of, of while you wait, especially those who are waiting for a law change, then uh, we are building this uh, coalition of collateral consequences and bringing in community and resources to help people um, proceed in a meaningful way, uh, whether that's with housing, employment, or other aspects. Uh, we are beginning bringing together a group of, of partners who work in this space to, to help people uh, in a holistic way. Um, that is one of the, the, the problems that uh, we noticed at the Cosmic Clinic are those who, who have a waiting period or those who unfortunately may not be eligible for an expungement. And then what is it that they do to, uh, to navigate through this through the collateral consequences. And we kind of even changed our, our vision to 
Uh, so CMR vision now is to alleviate the collateral consequences of all Missourians with a criminal record. And so that is something that we recognize and that we are working, building relationships with community organizations, our community partners, to address these issues that our fellow citizens face. I hope that answered uh, the the question. It's kind of just where things are right now. It's like this is the way things are, but we are, like you said, Johnny, um, assembling the helpers so that you don't feel so alone, um, so that you know that you're not alone, um, even as you're walking up this this rough road here. Um, Johnny, you mentioned somebody's having an event on April fifteenth. Yeah, and so I'll. I'll... I'll back up to April 31st. So April 3rd, nice. Okay. At, at April 3rd, it's the Courage to Change event. Uh, I'll be on the I'll be on the panel. It's uh, hosted by Reaching Out for Within. Me and Kyle Smith will be there. Both heads of the Department of Corrections of Missouri and Kansas will be there. Um, there'll be some people from, from Nebraska, uh, more particularly Omaha, and if anybody's aware. Um, a lot of things have come from Omaha that's been in, in KC, including the KC 350 model uh, that's hosted at Rockhurst University that was um, started in community partnership with Common Good um, and Classy's group and Reverend Dara Faulkner. Um, and so, yeah, come out and, and join us uh, April the 3rd. And then April the 15th, uh, Candace Wesson. Uh, so go to the help, the help, uh, My good friend and community partner, Candice Weston, she has opened a transitional home for women. Um, not only will the women get, they'll live there, they'll have access to financial literacy, education, they'll get uh, their products, like whatever products that, uh, that they need. They'll get employment skills, a job. And then the ultimate goal is to get uh, a home ownership. She's working with a good friend of mine, Asia Morris, who, who does this community project to get to get homes and the people who would who would not likely not get homes. And so there's this pipeline that's that's being built. So go to the help, sign up for Candace event, um, April fifteenth. Uh, you can go to our open house and 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 see what what she's doing uh, out there. So yeah, Candace is great. And I did drop the link to the Help KC um, in our chat. It's also on that resource list that I've shared and that I will share in the follow-up email for everybody. Um, so, and uh, Johnny, if you'll get me information about April 3rd, I'll send that out to everybody too, um, so that they oh, can see how to sign up for that. Um, so April 15th is the Help KC. I mentioned the living room conversation. <laughs> this is this is that's kind of what we're having today. It's like, hey, we're just hanging out and, and let's let's have this, uh, let's share information and share resources with each other. Um, you'll see us together again because uh, we are hosting uh, for National Week of Conversation on April nineteenth, uh, which is a Wednesday. Um, basically, a, a way for the community to come together. We're going to have a communal dinner together. And then um, be ready to have a structured conversation about restorative justice. And I'm going to drop our the the link to join us uh, for that event in in our chat. Um, and I'll also include it in the follow up email here um, that I'll that I will send to you all. But it's basically just a way for for folks to to under have a shared understanding of what does this mean. And what does this mean to me? And to say, I have questions and or I think differently about something and know that you're in a safe place to say, help me understand where where where, where you're coming from with the way you feel about it. Um, but we have a few more spots left um, and we'd really like to have you join us. It won't be a really big group. We're going to keep it small so we can um, can have this conversation in one night. <laughs> so. But the link's in there, and I would do hope that you'll come join us. Yeah. And then we have the mural unveiling for oh, the yeah. expungement mural at UMKC on April the 20th. So it'll be the very next day. Um, and that'll be at the Student Union on campus. Uh, uh, 
Simi will give you the address to the campus because I'm drawing a blank right here. But uh, yeah. well, and we'll send it out in, in a follow up email too. Yeah. We'll make yeah. It so a lot you of know things. the address to the law school by heart, but the student <laughs> union, right. I just realized I don't know. Yeah. Um, I know I have a Chick fil A. I get it. Yeah. They got Chick fil A. That's all I know. So, <laughs> That's always that's always helpful. And so yeah, great events coming up in April. April is uh, second chance month, and so to get to these these conversations, uh, I'm really looking forward to it and educating people, letting them know about collateral consequences and expungements, and you know, everybody can go visit cmrmo.org. Say how you can yeah. join us, and and uh, we'll keep you informed on the events from us, our community partners. And, and yes. Oh, thank you, Sydney. Fifty one hundred Cherry Street, Kansas City, Missouri, sixty four one ten. That's the yeah. that's the student union where the expungement mural will be unveiled on the twentieth. So yeah, <laughs> and the artist is Diazel and Tot. And so again, if you you go to docucourse.org and sign up for that free account. You can watch arts and advocacy and the muralist is Diazel and Todd. Uh, you can also check out one of her murals at 5008 Prospect, which is gift. She painted a mural inside a gift. Um, so it should be, should be great. I love it. I, have we covered everything that we wanted to? Or were there any questions outstanding while we're recording that we want to share? Or because we can do that. Um, uh, otherwise, I'll turn off the recording and see if anybody feels braver with the recording off. And um, if you think of questions later, you can um, email us at, and I'll give uh, the expungement clinic's email address. Um, both Johnny and I have access to it, so. Sometimes it's hard to put your thoughts in, into words um, on the spot, so I understand that completely. Expungementclinic at umkc.edu. That's, that's where you'll find that, so I'll get that out to everybody here. And then uh, I also um, include the clinic's phone number you um, prefer to talk uh, with your questions, you can call us too. So I'll send that out here. So these two things right here. I think what I'm gonna do with this last piece of information uh, sent in the chat to everyone is I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording so that we can have sort of our, have some off the record time. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop our recording and thank you all again for joining us. <laughs>